In this lesson, we'll begin to study colligative properties. We're going to study a number of these properties, and in this lesson, we'll focus on vapor pressure and boiling point. But first, what is a colligative property? Well, a colligative property is a property that depends only on solute concentration. So it depends on the solute concentration, that is how much solute I have there. It doesn't matter what the identity of that solute is. So if I dissolve a bunch of salt or a bunch of sugar, it doesn't matter, it just matters how much. Let me give you an example. One of the colligative properties that's easy to understand is boiling point elevation. If I dissolve a solute in a solution, it raises its boiling point. How much does it raise its boiling point? Well, that only depends on how much solute there is. So if I add more sugar, it's going to raise the boiling point more. Okay, but there's three other colligative properties we're going to take a look at. We're going to look at vapor pressure lowering. So that is the lowering of vapor pressure by dissolving a solute. We're going to look at freezing point depression. That is the reduction of our freezing point based on adding a solute. And that's what you see here. This truck is spreading salt on the roads to lower the freezing point of water to make it melt so that cars don't slip around. And then lastly, osmotic pressure, which turns out to be the pressure due to a difference in solute concentration. Okay, in this lesson, we're going to focus just on vapor pressure lowering and boiling point elevation. And then in future lessons, we'll take a look at freezing point depression and osmotic pressure. Okay, what is vapor pressure? Before we can think about lowering it, we should understand what it is. Vapor pressure is the partial pressure due to an evaporated solvent above a solution. That sounds like a lot. It's kind of a lot to keep track of, but there's a really common example that's much easier to understand, which is humidity. When you say it's humid outside, what you mean is there's moisture in the air. And that's what we're talking about when we think about vapor pressure. The vapor pressure of moisture in the air just is the humidity. It's how much water there is in the air. And we can measure that with something we introduced in Chem 12 11, which is called partial pressure. So it's specifically the pressure that just comes from the gas we're interested in, in this case, H2O. Maybe here it's 0.5 atm. Okay? Now, one thing you should know is that vapor pressure increases with increasing temperature. So as we increase the temperature, this vapor pressure would go higher, which we kind of know. We know that humidity gets worse and worse when the temperature continues to increase. Okay, so that's vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is not a colligative property. It definitely depends what the substance is made of. Water will have a different vapor pressure than, say, acetone. But lowering of a vapor pressure, that is a colligative property. And that's what we're taking a look at now. So when I dissolve a solute into a solution, so over here I have a bunch of purple solute molecules. Does it matter what those are? No. No, it doesn't. Because it's a colligative property. All that matters is how many I've put in there. And what happens when I put those solutes down into solution is it lowers the vapor pressure. It's reduced by adding a non-volatile solute. Non-volatile just means it's not prone to evaporate, right? So if you put something that's really volatile in there, then this doesn't happen. But if you put salt or sugar or most of these regular compounds that are non-volatile, they don't evaporate easily, then we get this vapor pressure lowering. Let's look at the mathematical expression that explains vapor pressure lowering. Here we see PA, which represents the lowered vapor pressure. So it's the pressure that's been reduced. And then we see XA. That turns out to be the mole fraction of our solvent. So how much of our solution is made of solvent versus solute. And then lastly, we look at the vapor pressure of the pure solvent all by itself. So if I think about this equation and the figure I have to the left, right here I would have pressure H2O with a little asterisk. It would be the pressure of H2O when there's no solute present. And then next to it, I would have pH2O, and it wouldn't have the asterisk. That would be the lowered vapor pressure because I've dissolved some solute. Okay, so when I go and dissolve these purple solute molecules, my vapor pressure is lowered. And if I want to know by how much, I have to calculate the mole fraction. And we'll practice doing that. Okay, here is a practice example. It says compute the vapor pressure of an ideal solution containing 92.1 grams of glycerin and 184.4 grams of ethanol at 40 degrees Celsius. The vapor pressure of pure ethanol is 0.178 atm at 40 degrees Celsius. Glycerin is essentially non-volatile at this temperature. Okay, so it's telling you glycerin is the solute that we're mixing in. So in other words, we can imagine having a picture of pure ethanol. So this would be ethanol. And we know that the pressure of pure ethanol is 0 0.178 atm. Okay, that would have a little star on it because that's the pressure of ethanol when it's all by itself, a pure solvent. And now what happens is I'm going to have ethanol and then I'm going to go dissolve some glycerin in it. 
And that's gonna reduce my vapor pressure, right? It's called vapor pressure lowering. Now my pressure would be something lower than 0.178 ATM. And that's what we wanna figure out. If we wanna do that, the very first step is to find the mole fraction. And because we're given grams, we have to go grams to moles. This is something we've done a lot. We're gonna write down grams of each and we're gonna divide by the molar mass. So let's take a look at that. Here we see that we've taken our grams of glycerin, which was 92.1 and we've divided by the molar mass of glycerin, and we now have the moles of glycerin. Similarly, we took the grams of ethanol, and we divided by the molar mass of ethanol, and we got out the moles of ethanol. Okay, now if we want to calculate our new partial pressure, what we have to do is we have to calculate our mole fraction, and that's this expression right here. We did go over mole fraction briefly in our other concentrations lessons. So here, the way we're gonna calculate it our mole fraction for ethanol. Remember, we're looking at the solvent when we calculate the mole fraction. So when I think about what goes up top, it's gonna to be moles of solvent. Here, my ethanol is my solvent. How do I know that? Well, a couple ways. One is typically there's more solvent than solute. Secondly, it tells you glycerin is essentially non-volatile. So it's telling you, oh, this guy is my solute. It also tells me the vapor pressure of pure ethanol. Another hint that ethanol is my solvent. Okay, so ethanol is my solvent. Just FYI, most of the time your solvent is going to be water, and then you won't have to ask that question. It's a little trickier when it's glycerin and ethanol. So the mole fraction of ethanol is going to put the moles of ethanol up top, which we know is 4, and then we're going to have the moles of everything all together on the bottom, which is 1 mole of glycerol plus 4 moles of ethanol. So that's going to give us 4 over 5, or 0.8. Okay, so that's 0 0.8. Now, if I want to calculate the new vapor pressure, I need to plug that into my expression and know that my new vapor pressure for ethanol, ETOH is a fancy abbreviation for ethanol, by the way, I'm going to put in my mole fraction, 0 0.8, times my original vapor pressure, which is PA with the little star on it. And remember, we were told that vapor pressure was 0.178 ATM. And so we're going to put 0 0.178 ATM. When we do that, we're basically just taking 80% of 0.178, and we're going to get 0 0.142 ATM. Okay, so that's the new reduced lowered vapor pressure. Lowered vapor pressure. Okay? So vapor pressure can be reduced by adding a non-volatile solute. Critically, that's really related to our boiling point elevation. The reason that is, is that boiling point is when vapor pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure. So what that means is you have some water and it's at 25 degrees Celsius. If you looked at the vapor pressure, maybe it's 0.1 ATM. And as you heat it, the vapor pressure gets higher and higher and higher and higher. And at 100 degrees Celsius, which is the normal boiling point of water, the vapor pressure would be 1 ATM and the pressure around it would be 1 ATM. And that's when all of my solution is just going to pour out into the gas phase. Okay, so because vapor pressure is lowered, we actually get boiling point elevation. So boiling point elevation is a direct consequence of that vapor pressure lowering. And what is it? Well, it's increasing the boiling point by adding a non-volatile solute. Again, it's a colligative property. It just matters how much of that non-volatile solute we have. Here's the expression to calculate a change in boiling point. We have delta Tb here, which is an increase in the boiling point. We have Kb, which is our boiling point elevation constant. Basically, we have different boiling point elevation constants for different substances. And then lastly, we have molality, and that's of the solute. Remember, molality is a unit of concentration. That's moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. And so we'll have to calculate that often if we're going to see how much a boiling point has changed. The whole idea here is we're adding a non-volatile solute, and the boiling point is changing. Let's do an example problem there. The normal boiling point of chloroform is 61 degrees Celsius, with a boiling point elevation constant of 3.63 degrees Celsius per molality. If 0.36 moles of iodine is added to 0.8 kilograms of chloroform, what is the new elevated boiling point? Okay, that's a lot. Remember, the normal boiling point, right here, 61 degrees Celsius, is the boiling point when there's no solute in my chloroform. And this, the the 3.63 is telling me my Kb. It's the boiling point constant. And what that's saying is, for every one molal solution I have, it's going to change the boiling point by 3.63 degrees Celsius. Okay? And then we're actually told some information about the solution. We know we have iodine and chloroform. 
Again, we're gonna need to identify the solvent and the solute, and that's step one here on our uh, problem solving chart. So step one is identify the solvent and solute. Here, we're told the boiling point of chloroform, and so that's a good hint that that's gonna be our solvent. So the thing that's boiling is gonna be our solvent. So 0 0.80 kilograms of chloroform, that's our solvent. And what we're dissolving in it is our solute, which is iodine. And that's gonna help us when we go to calculate now the molality. Okay, so if I want to calculate the new boiling point, I'm gonna to need to get the molality. And so that's step two. So molality, my expression is right down here in the bottom right. And molality is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. So my moles of solute is just given to me 0 0.36 moles. And my kilograms of chloroform is also given to me. That's 0 0.80. Now, you could imagine sometimes they might give you here the grams of iodine. You have to go grams to moles. Or they might give you the density of chloroform and the volume. And you might have to go from density and volume to mass. So all sorts of variations you can see here. But this is the basic process. So what's the molality? Well, when we divide 0.36 by 0.8, we get 0 0.45 mole. Mole is the weird way you say molality after the concentration. Okay, now we need to calculate the change in temperature. So what's the change in my boiling point? Well, that's equal to Kb times my molality. And so Kb we know is 3.63 times my molality, which we just calculated is 0 0.45. So the real hard part about these problems is identifying solvent and solute and thinking about it clearly like that. The math is actually usually pretty straightforward. So the change in temperature we get there is 1.6 three, three, five. So that's a change in temperature. And I'm just gonna put all the digits there. We've determined delta T, but now to get our new boiling point, which is what it's asking for, we have to add that delta T to the original boiling point, right? Because what this represents is an increase in boiling point. It's saying the boiling point increased by 1.6335 degrees Celsius. So if I wanna get that new boiling point, I have to take the original boiling point, which was 61 degrees Celsius, and I have to add to it my change, which is 1.6335. And so when I add 61 to 1.6335, I'm going to get 62.6335. And then if I think about rounding for sig figs, I got two sig figs and many numbers in the problem. And so rounding that to two sig figs is going to give me 63 degrees Celsius. So that's the new elevated boiling point that we got from dissolving a solute iodine. Remember, it didn't matter that it was iodine. It could have been any old solute. And that's the point, that's a colligative property, when it doesn't depend on the identity of the solute, but just the concentration.